Okay, uh, so uh, this, so far we talk about some of the basics of data science, which is the introduction and motivation for data science. Uh, and we talk some basic tools like probability theory and linear programming and network X. These are some basic stuff that you can use essentially to solve any problem that you have it in some sense. And formulate it and solve it. Today we are continuing this. And one of, if you remember, one of the important part of this fundamental word stats or statistics that we want to talk about some of them. And they are especially very useful in uh, something like uh, A-B testing that is like essential for big tech. Everything you cannot, I mean, do anything without knowing about A-B testing. And that's the main part of it is essentially a stat that we are talking about. Uh, great. So uh, having said that, yeah. I mean, if we are talking about, I mean, this, this is like a cartoon essentially say that uh, I didn't uh, use to think correlation implied causation, which is not necessarily the case. If you remember, we talk about it, that might be the, the day is hot means that I go into the pool and I'm going and having ice cream, but having an ice cream and go to the pool, not none of them causes the other ones. They have a correlation, but nothing like a causation. Anyhow, and causations and correlations are very important. You can read more about this beyond the class. I'm sure that you have some other classes that you are taking for stats, and they should talk about that, especially causation and correlation. These are more causations. There are lots of research and papers on that. Uh, today, uh, let's talk about I mean, some basics of statistics. And then we are talking about some basic uh, uh, of uh, like uh, ML, different ML algorithms and which one you can use it on uh, like general ideas. Uh, you may, you should have a deep dive for those ML algorithms later um, in other courses that you have. And here we are not talking that much about the neural nets, that's the whole thing that you can have it also in the future. So, I mean, the, some of these algorithms for neural nets, for example, are similar to XGBoost and other things, that is the basic sounds. Okay, so the, uh, some uh, terms and definition. So we talk about quantitative data. Quantitative, it, here it can be like a discrete or continuous, which are essentially numbers. Or we may talk about categorical. Categorical means, I mean, zip code, for example, names, etc. And this generally means no inherent order among the values. So if there is no inherent order, then we call it generally categorical, otherwise it's quantitative. Other things that we are talking about are population versus samples. Population generally is a set of uh, objects or unit under considerations. And a capital N typically means the number of items in the whole population. Sample is a subset of the data, is a subset of population. And typically by uh, non-capital N, we mean the number of samples that you will get. And general statistics try to essentially work with the samples and try to infer things about the whole population. This is a bit different from machine learning. So at, at statistics, that it was there for a long time. Uh, so we don't have access to the whole data. You can think about, I mean, uh, I don't know, how many of you have seen the movie Matrix? Yeah. So there's the Oracle there, and that Oracle is the one that we have it here. So you can think about some oracle that they are providing some samples from us. That you will hear a lot in computer science. So that oracle that essentially goes and uh, gets some samples from you. So uh, uh, that's the one that we are working mainly with uh, aesthetics, uh, with statistics on those stuff to infer uh, important things essentially. Uh, however, in machine learning, like for example, some of these uh, LLMs or others, in general machine learning, we are assuming that we have the whole data and we try to learn something about the future data. So it's a bit uh, different in that sense. However, having said that, uh, the, there is always this cost if you want to uh, access the whole data. Like, yes, LLMs, you can run it, but this is, I think, uh, 400, uh, 
uh, terabyte of data of the web that you need to run and uh, uh, train your system on that. And not everyone has uh, such a capability, like essentially $4 million or even more essentially, just the cost of training. And not every company has it. So that is always the cost is the issue that even if we have access to the whole population, we may not be able to run it because of the computational issues. And computational issues, of course, the speed, but of course you can parallelize things. But at the end of the day, the cost is the main important factor. So sometimes we are just using statistics because the otherwise the cost of running on the whole data is too much essential. So statistics are still relevant. Uh, I mean, we have descriptive uh, as statistics. These are just some statistics that you use to summarize or ascribe essentially the set of um, observations that we have. Yeah. Uh, so here we are not, uh, so we try to essentially from the samples, we try to give you, I mean, some summary of the data, essentially. Summary of the observation. This is different from that learning something about, uh, uh, from the samples, uh, like we, we try to learn, uh, about the whole population by learning from sample. This is generally called inferential statistics. Maybe more to more closer to the ML algorithms, machine learning. But in the descriptive, we just try to uh, uh, summarize the or describe the set of observation that we get. So, what about this uh, central uh, tendency or like the main? tools that we have it. Here we have mean, which is essentially numerical average of the things. That's mean essentially. The main problem is that it is heavily influenced by outliers, because if you bring one infinity, if you try to take the average, and one infinity you bring it, the whole average becomes infinity. So one error can make it. There's another one which is better, median. So median is the middle value. So you will order them, and then you will take the middle values. That is much more uh, essentially uh, resilient to the color, uh, to noise, outliers or noise. Because if you bring an infinity, you may change a little bit the uh, essentially the middle guy. Anyhow. And that is considered the most representative form. There is also the mod, which is the most frequently occurring value. That is in general uh, used for categorical data. This, the first two are used more for this kind of uh, quantitative data or number. This one is used more for categorical data that uh, uh, here, for example, mean and median does not mean that much. Uh, other than that, so far we have just seen one number, mod, median, or uh, mod, uh, median or mean. Here, you know, sometimes you want to get a little bit more uh, than that. So these are the things that is used. For example, uh, sometimes you want to know the range of values, the mean and max. So this is a little bit more uh, essential. Uh, so um, descriptions. So you have the whole data, then we get some samples from them. Then from these samples, we can just get one number. Mean, median, uh, mod. But you may go a little bit more. So can you give me a little bit more? So what are the range of this one? A little bit more description would be mean and max. Uh, another one which is very important is a standard deviation. Uh, so, it, and it, we talk about it generally it provides an estimate of the average difference of each value uh, comparing to the mean. Uh, we have defined essentially variance, and then we said that standard deviation is just a square root of that. Uh, it is a slightly different formula for samples versus population. You have, you will put it n minus one in the samples, or n in the population, or something like this. It's a slight things. If you want to do that, you can just see that one. And there is some uh, logic for that. Uh, uh, the other one is used. Uh, it is called uh, kurtosis. Uh, this is the measure of tail. So essentially, if you have uh, uh, something like this, uh, like so, uh, sometimes I mean the normal distribution can be like this. This is like a light tail, but sometimes it can be something like this, heavy tail. So this is some measure tail. Dance. This is the formula for that. This is sigma and mu. Essentially, are the 
these are the formula that sigma and mu, the one that we talk about it, uh, about mean or uh, average or standard deviations. This is the exact formula. But this essentially describes that, I mean, uh, how much this is a more pointy distribution versus how much is this kind of heavy tail distribution. Uh, another one is skewness. Skewness is a measure of asymmetry. To essentially, to see that, for example, this data that you have is more like this or it is more like this, essentially. And these are, uh, I mean, different ways to quantify this. And maybe there, even sometimes there is a different definition for some of them. Uh, but these are some of these, a little bit more about the data. But the most important thing, this is actually, a, a, a yeah. On the, uh, that curve method, the measure of skewness. Yeah. So when the, the number is smaller, it's more skewed or it's bigger. Yeah, I, 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 as I mentioned, so I mean, yes, I mean, this is like, there are, I mean, essentially, I mean, the definition, like you know, this is these are the things that actually I want to say that they are different. A statistician they have defined it differently, but I mean you can I mean one minus the other one essentially means the uh, other one. I think I have seen both of them essentially. Uh, but but you can define which formula, and as you mentioned, one of them means essentially if it's a small means less skewed. The other one is means more more Exactly. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is actually the very important things. Uh, uh, and comes uh, to our test. So it's not like, uh, these are the problems that as statisticians are working on them for a long time. And they are doing research, they have a papers on that. And this is actually an interesting thing. So uh, and comes uh, to our test. It's like essentially four set of data that these are, in some sense, they are completely different. But all of these uh, important parameters that we are talking, mean sample variance, so these are like X and Y essentially. Generally, I mean, we have X and Y for this one. Uh, if you consider mean variance, uh, sample mean correlations, linear regression, and several parameters of this, all of them are exactly the same. The only way that you can see these different, these, no, these essentially points are quite different from each other when you draw them essentially, and you see they are completely different. And this is again, these are some of the papers that the people are doing that. What's the meaning of that? It means that uh, this is essentially some kind of information theory. So when you have n bits, you cannot essentially compress it into n minus one bit. You lose some precision. So this number that I mentioned it gives you some ideas, but it's not the exact preciseness of the actual thing. So here, as I mentioned, these numbers are somehow try to summarize, try to compress, give you some ideas. But at the end of the day, you see that they are completely different than giving them. And of course, these are some of the things that the people like maybe handmade that, or worst case that the people have mentioned. It. Maybe in practice that does not happen, but I think I just want to warn you that, yes, it may happen that you get all these numbers the same, but the distribution that you have it are completely different. This is an example, essentially. And again, these are some of the things that statisticians are working a lot on those set of problems, papers, etc. Uh, so this is also so the shape of distribution, as I mentioned. The shape of the distribution becomes very important because when you see it, you see all the difference. But from this number and this uh, descriptions or this summary, you don't see the numbers. And here, these are uh, some of these, uh, I mean, here, uh, it's some of these called histograms, essentially, that the shape of the distribution, you can see it, essentially. The histogram, also in Python, if you say, if you give the, uh, the, the data, you can get the histogram and then give you, essentially, this uh, it draws this one. So for example, you may have symmetric or unimodular. Unimodular means one max, essentially. SQ right, SQ left, a bimodal. Bimodal means, essentially, we have two maximum. Or it can be multimodal several things, or it can be like almost symmetric essentially. So this is almost some kind of symmetry. Uh, and there are lots of other that they can uh, plot multivariate data and math plots is the one that you can use it essentially to draw all of this. And some of this data, as I mentioned, hist histogram or something, you can also uh, draw it uh, even without math plot essentially and give you the, this idea. So uh, the shape is important because as I mentioned in the previous case, 
So in some sense, shape is another way of summarizing this data. Of course, you don't see all the data. If there's a trillion of data, you don't see it. You will just see some summarization of the data, but that is very descriptive. Uh, so the other one is about uh, inferential statistics that I mentioned. So these were the descriptive statistics. What about inferential statistics? So here, the main goal is that, I mean, we want to understand something. So there, if we try to just, in the descriptive, we try to just summarize the data that we will get it from the samples. Here, the idea is that we want to deduce uh, some properties of the underlying probability distributions by analyzing the sample. So here, we try to essentially learn something about the actual population, not just some summary of the samples that Uh, so here we are uh, uh, giving uh, the idea essentially in the next slide. Uh, but the whole idea is that we try, generally we try to build a statistical model of the process which generates this data. And then uh, from that, so we try to essentially uh, somehow build a model that can say that, okay, this is the model that can generate my data possibly. And then from that, I try to get essentially different uh, parameters like a point estimate, confidence level, et cetera. So that we are talking more essentially here. And a good example of this is that when we try to do the polling essentially, when the, we try to, uh, I mean, have a poll to see who wins the ele an election. So in some sense, we try to build an statistical model and we get some data based on that and generate something such that we can infer something about the actual populations. So here, in some sense, it doesn't matter what is the average of the thing that we get it. The issue is that can, they, can this represent the actual population or not? That is somehow the infer uh, uh, inferential statistics. So uh, here, uh, some of these things that we try to, I mean, uh, so we try to get, uh, as I mentioned, we try to get, create some models such that we can deduce different points. What are these different points, for example? Uh, but a uh, different point about the actual population. For example, uh, here we may, Now here we may define some kind of point estimate. So uh, we may want to find what is the mean of the population. This is different from the mean of the samples that we had it before. We try to create a model that you can actually see what is the mean of the actual distribution. Uh, like a good example of this is essentially this one that you have a, a, like a new website you have created or a new recommendation system it is created, you want to see whether this new website or recommendation works better than the others. Here, you want to infer something about the actual population who are using this. Really just some numbers for, for you is not that important. You want to see whether from this you can create a model, uh, for example, hypothesis testing or other things that say that, okay, this new website or this new recommendation system is surely better than the, or the original. So uh, of course, so here we may get some of this such that we can get mean of the population. Uh, another one is that we want to get some kind of confidence level. So you want to get some confidence le level A, B, like between A and B. And this is a confidence level of say 95% of what? That we want to, uh, so uh, uh, like you may want to get a, con a confidence interval A, B, this confidence level 95%. What's the meaning of that? It means that if you, re you repeatedly draw samples 
from the population, 95% of the time uh, that uh, the, tr the, the true mean of the, this population actually lies between this interval A, B. So in some sense, uh, in, the, in the first one, we just try to get uh, some number from this. Here you to get some kind of uh, uh, interval, essentially. I say 95% of the time, uh, the, uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, and this is very important. So we want to say 90% of the time, the true mean of the population will lie in the range computed from the sample. So this is a, a confidence level that you may have. It. And generally, I mean, these are some of the interesting things. So whenever you have some kind of higher com uh, confidence level, if you want to have a higher confidence level, you should have a bigger interval. That's natural, because then you cover more cases. Whenever you have a, a higher variability, then you have also bigger interval, because it would be harder to say that. And last but not least, this is very important. If you want to get a smaller interval, essentially more precise things, the, the way to go is to have a higher number of samples. And this is the main thing. So like, for example, if you want to see this website is better than the other website, always it's better to put more traffic to this to see, understand. But the, the problem is that there is almost, I mean, always there is some trade-off between the cost of new things, because you may put essentially new traffic here, just think about, I mean, Amazon, Google, etc. If you want, first, I mean, there might be 100 tests that are run simultaneously in these companies for different algorithms, different recommendations, etc. And then each of them can get only a tiny of this, not the whole traffic. But other than that, also, if you give, even if you are able to get a big portion, the issue is that maybe this new website or this new recommendation system just, I mean, has a problem, then you are losing essentially potentially billions of dollars because like Amazon quarterly uh, just income is something like 140 billion. So you can just divide it over 90 days. Like each day essentially something like 1.5 billion. And then if you want to run it, I don't know, for two weeks, which is a typical thing, it would be, I mean, you will compute it. It's like in the huge things essentially. Uh, so you should be very careful. So this is always this trade-off between the number of samples that you have versus uh, the essentially confidence level that you have. And you need to find, uh, so the number of samples versus how precise the things that are. But you need to make it trade-off because there is a cost essentially involved if you want to get a higher number of samples. And so, And this is one important thing about the normal distributions. So if you have some kind of normal distribution, this is a very important one. This is this number that actually has been, I have seen this one in some Facebook interviews or something that you should know about it. 99.7% of the values fall within three times a standard deviation. 95% is two standard deviation. That's actually more top, typical thing that the people consider. Like 5% error is the typical thing. Sometimes 1% or 5%, but 5% is more logical. And 68% essentially is just for one. What formal distributions are important? This is because of central limit theorem. So uh, this is essentially a theorem. So if you say sample size, essentially uh, approaches infinity, becomes very large. Distribution of this sample means always follow a normal distribution, irrespective of the actual distribution that you have. So uh, that's the thing that makes essentially normal distribution. So if you have essentially um, uh, your sample size becomes large, 
the mean that you will get it essentially irrespective of the distribution that you have becomes more like a normal distribution. But some other distribution that we talked some of them before, like so normal is very important because of this central limit. And you can learn more about it and what is that. In, in general, I mean, this, uh, uh, this uh, central limit theorem, uh, also this is one of the important things about this kind of normal distribution is that they are very concentrated often. So uh, like you said that if the number of samples, uh, there are lots of other different names for this, but in general, you said that if you have a zero one variables, which are randomly go zero and one, if the number of these guys becomes large, then they become very concentrated among their mean essentially. And what would be the concentration essentially? The concentration would be essentially very similar to the normal distribution. Like the mean of these things will come from a normal distribution. But that's the idea is that like uh, the in short is that when the number of samples becomes large, if it is random and they are, this is also if there's not much correlation between them, then you get a very nice and concentrated answer. So normal distribution is important. It has lots of application, normal or Gaussian. Other one that we already talked about it, binomial distribution, that you have uh, essentially probability, probability of uh, essentially coming hit and you are doing N of them and you want to see what is the probability that you are getting essentially uh, two heads or three heads or something. Another one that we talk about is uh, uh, Poisson distribution. So in the Poisson distribution, as we discussed, so uh, we are keeping, the, this is some kind of polynomial distribution that we will keep the mean uh, or uh, like uh, essentially the, yeah, uh, so a uh, lambda of the mean, we keep it essentially at, a, at some constant things and we are allowing n goes to infinity. What's the meaning of that? This essentially means that what is the, um, so it is a probability distribution. It says that uh, if I have this mean of the distribution, how many times I will get one head? But the mean is constant because you have fixed the mean essentially. Uh, so if I, this, this mean, if n goes to infinity, how many, if I run this one, how many times I will get 10 heads? How many times I will get 20 heads? And so on and so forth. But the mean is the essentially is somehow fixed. And this is one important property of this Poisson distribution is being memoryless. What's the meaning of that? It means that like if the, uh, this essentially something happened in the past does not say about the future. So if in the past, uh, like five minutes, for example, you can think about this one. So you may have essentially, a, you may have a shop. So uh, you know that in the past five minutes, like one customer came. This does not give you any information about the next five minutes. However, if you go to bus stop and you know that the bus stop just left two minutes ago, that means that probably the bus will not come in the next 10 minutes. This is something that the, essentially, and Poisson has this thing. So if like it's some interval, nothing has happened, the past interval doesn't see anything about the future. And this is some good properties of uh, Poisson, as I mentioned. It's using queuing theory, et cetera, that is used. And you can read essentially lots of these distributions and the applications. I try to just give uh, some of these, for example, this queuing theory is one important thing. The other one is the Ziff's law. This is also uh, very interesting things. Generally, it, it says that uh, this, is, uh, this is some kind of distribution. Say, for example, uh, if you are ranking the words according to the number of times that appear in some text, then the word frequency is somehow in proportional to the inverse of word rank. What's the meaning of that? So, for example, uh, I think da is the one that is appearing the most. So that appears something like 70k in some corpus, some corpus of data. Now, uh, the other one is of, that appears like 35K in a typical. That actually not only this one says that it's proportional to that, but is that the first one, the, is comes twice as the second. So the is the most frequent word, 
the number of things that appear in the text is like 70. Always the next one, it appears 35. Okay, there is another one, I think maybe and or something like this. And that was something like around, uh, I don't know, 24K or something. This is that the, this one, the da is coming like the three times the third batch. It, generally, these are some of the ones that exponential. We are essentially, they come exponentially down. And that's the reason that we are often using the log uh, scale things to show them. In the log scale, they will be like essentially lines. Uh, but in general, it might be, I mean, these are like a different curve, but generally this kind of log curve is used a lot in some of this representation. <laughs> Another example is this one. It says that, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, the number of times that you have a word is that according to the how many characters that has. Those that they have higher number of characters, much lower chance of appearing in it. And again, uh, how often this is somehow similar to this, like the one that has the least number of words is coming generally uh, twice as the one that has the second number of words, etc. And of course, uh, like this two, it might be 1.5 or something. That essentially something that uh, decides about a slope of this line in the largest scale. Another important distribution that, I mean, we talk about was on nominal Bernoulli before and normal. These are some extra things. These are, you may hear more about in data science. Another one is the beta distribution. So beta distribution, so in some sense, binomial distribution is probability of that how many heads are coming, how many uh, like uh, tail is coming. So uh, beta distribution, gives a probability distribution on probabilities. So it says that, I mean, the probability of this, like, I think about this one, like, uh, uh, for example, um, a soccer uh, um, player, a kicker who is uh, doing, uh, or like I mean, say essentially a soccer games, uh, between two teams. And here, you want to see what is the probability that, uh, what is the probability that this uh, first person, the first team essentially wins versus the second one. So what would be the distribution, or like maybe you want to say, what is the probability that gets one score? What is the probability that gets two scores? And these probabilities, you want to get some uh, probability distribution on the probability. So for example, you know that the probability will not be zero. The probability would be between, I mean, that team wins versus this other team wins, for example, is between 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 or something. Uh, this is the one that, uh, this is somehow try to get the probability. In the formulation, is a bit, this is somehow the intuition, but the formulation is more complicated. But this is something it is uh, important a lot, beta distribution, for uh, some kind of reinforcement learning. So the, for reinforcement learning, what is the idea is that you want to, for example, you decide that um, this is also called multi-arm bandits, essentially, are very similar to that. You want to uh, um, decide, uh, like a, a customer is coming to your website. You may want to give a discount. Uh, in the reinforcement learning, the idea is that you may want to decide to some of the, pe the people that you have a history for them, you may want to give a discount because you know that according to that, you know, how many times they use a discount that how much, how many times they bought from you. You, you, you can decide that I want to give some coupons to them. But sometimes you may decide to give to some unknown people as well because you don't know and you want to learn. This is this essentially the whole concept of um, reinforcement learning or multi-arm bandits is essentially the trade-off between uh, um, exploration and exploitation. Exploration means that new people are coming, you don't have the data, you may still want to give them something to test and you will learn more. And exploitation is that okay, you, you know the data, so based on the data, maybe I should not waste too much in the new people, I just use them. 
That one, there are two algorithms. It is one called epsilon greedy. Epsilon greedy is essentially an algorithm that you, one minus epsilon of the time, you are essentially giving to the customers that you know before. Epsilon time, you will just try new, essentially uncharted what. That is called epsilon greedy. Another algorithm, which is very important, is Thompson sampling. That's a bit more involved, but actually that uses beta distribution. So beta distribution is a place that, for example, is used a lot with this uh, things. A zip uh, law distribution is used a lot, for example, this you may heard also power law distribution, that uh, rich becomes richer. For example, uh, this is the case that if you have uh, like uh, more followers than me at Twitter, it means that probably also in the course of next week or one or like I don't know one month, you get more followers than me essentially. That's the idea of that rich becomes richer essentially. But the same thing here essentially that when you say that a frequent most frequent word versus the word line, so rich word the one like da gets twice more uh, like a frequency than the second rich word which is. Uh, like in this case, for example, of. So uh, this one is uh, especially is useful. I mean, the power law distributions. Uh, and this kind of rich becomes richer. This one is, as I mentioned, this is used essentially for uh, Thompson sampling. Sampling, which is essentially for the multi bandits problem. So this is, again, this is some very high level things, but I just want to give you the point that um, you will see that one, again, essentially, according to my experience. There might be some other places, but these are the most important things that you may uh, hear about it. So, so the Thompson sampling, the analysis is based on that. So to run the Thompson sampling, you need to actually complete the beta distribution. You, have, you want to essentially, so the beta distribution in other places also is used, like for example, probability of click. So you want to say that, I mean, or probability of conversion. You want to have some distributions about the probability of click for these things. So for this particular ad, I don't know, the probability uh, of um, like, uh, uh, yeah, this is the probability of uh, uh, click. And then for the probability of click, you want to have some kind of probability. You can actually learn more about it. I don't want to go that much to the, details of it, but that is the thing that you can go. And there are lots of math involved, like the formulation of the beta function. Uh, generally, it has alpha and beta. It's very similar in that sense, actually, to the binomial distributions, but it's more complicated. But these are important set of probabilities that you are seeing a lot in data science. Another thing that I want to talk about is the hypothesis testing that is very important. So, here, the main things about hypothesis testing is that you want to accept or reject a statistical hypothesis about a population. A typical thing, again, as I mentioned, it is like that you, that you create a new website. And this is like the most important thing, essentially, in the big tech. You have a new algorithm. You have a new website. And you want to say that this is working better than the previous one. Generally, we have two types of hypothesis, null hypothesis. Null hypothesis means that this algorithm does not work significantly better than the previous. There is an H1 or alternative uh, hypothesis so that no, this is different from the previous. Good. Or this website is different. In terms. It can be better or worse, but it says it is different. So H1 and H2, generally, you should decide what are these hypotheses. But H1 and H2 should be exclusive and exhaustive. It means that these two websites, either they are like the same or they are different. So that's the thing. It is exclusive on either or. And at the same time, exhaustive. I mean, either this is the case or this is the case. You will hear, essentially, here a word called a statistical significance. Uh, and this is the most important thing. You want to make sure that this is essentially the null hypothesis. What is the problem? The problem is that maybe this is a slightly better, but you want to see whether this is significant enough 
to say that this is really better than this website. And this is the one that is called a statistical significance. But this is the, in this particular example deciding if the coin is fair. You can see this example. But here I want to just mention essentially this uh, particular case. Uh, so in the hypothesis testing, you are you want to decide on H0 and H1. H0, as I mentioned, like if you want to have a new website or new algorithm, H0 generally means that these two algorithms are not that much different. In terms of profit or other things, they are not. Or click through rate, these are new recommendation system, and the people don't click that much more in this new website company. H1 means no. This is this website is different from one. It can be more, it can be essentially less. That you can also test it differently. I mean, that is I mean, that of course the thing. But but you want to be able to compare this website with the previous. And you just want to make sure that. If this one seems like, maybe in average, this is better than the others, but it might be not significant enough that say that this website is really better. Maybe just by chance, because these people are maybe just go more to this website than this website, or some event happens that this is essentially, or some biases that we talk. And this is the uh, things that is important. So here we are defining the significance level so the significance level, you can say sigma, for example, is generally the significance level that we are talking about. You want to get 99% sure, you want to be 99% sure, or you want to be 95% sure. These are the typical things. So the, typically, the 5% and 1% is the one that, so whether you want to get 95% essentially assurance or 99%. Of course, if you want to get the higher things, then you should see uh, much more difference essentially. This. And there is a formulation that you should use. So uh, uh, this is the typical. So you need to decide about what are H0 versus H1. You want to decide which test you should use. There are several tests. It is called retest. These are something like a T test. It is called also a student test or F test. There might be some other test. So the FTS is generally, these are the difference for the, for example, the stand, uh, standard deviations. But this one is more like the mean. So you need to decide about uh, uh, which test you want to use. And for example, the test is generally used to see that this distribution that you are seeing is dif not different from the previous. Um, okay, so you may have some website and you want to compare yourself among the previous website. Sometimes it is like two approaches and you want to compare these two approaches. That's the one that the t-test is used more essentially. This is more like A-B testing essentially. One is called control that you don't change it. The other one is like treatment that you are changing. Anyhow, so you decide which, which one of them is there, like H1 or H0. Then you define which test you want to use it. Then from the observed value, you compute the test the statistic T observed. So uh, you see, for example, you say that, okay, you want to do that, there's some formulation. You see uh, how many, what is the mean of these things that you get it. You From this data that you got it, the people clicked or not. From that, you can say, what is the uh, like mean of the number of people who clicked? So you compute these numbers. Uh, the, the, the corresponding, so each of these formula, V test, T test, or F test, you can do that. This is some formula. From the data, you will come, from the, the sample that you have, you will compute this number. Now, from that, you need to compute the p-value. How do you compute the p-value? When you have this compute, the, the value of this uh, T observed, then you will go, to, all, all of these tests, they have a table generally. There's a computer table or there's a manual one. From this table, you say, okay, this my number is this. N is the number of samples is this. My value of this test becomes this. Then it gives you some p-value. You can get some software essentially for that. When you have that p-value, then you will compute this p-value versus the sigma essentially. Generally, if the uh, you will reject the null hypothesis, if this p-value is less than sigma, 
So, for example, if you if you want to have five percent error essentially in some sense, then if your p value is less than five percent, then you say that the null hypothesis is rejected. What's the meaning of that? It means that this significantly or like this like the uh, with a significant probability is different from the previous. If it is less than, if it is greater than that, it means that no, I mean, it's not clear. Uh, it is not significant enough to say that this is better than, or like it is different from the previous. You have two type of error here, type one error and type two error. In the type one error, this is the, uh, so type one error is that you are rejecting the null hypothesis by mistake. So really, this website is not different from the previous website, but you say that, no, this website is much better, or this algorithm. Uh, the other one is uh, these things that, the type two error, this is, the, you accept the null hypothesis, say, oh, these two websites are the same, but really this website is better than. So uh, this type one error and type one uh, it's error, and of course, if this sigma it becomes like one percent, then the this type of error, uh, the chance becomes much lower. Uh, if you want to get with ninety nine percent, you make sure that this is better than the others. The only problem is that uh, to get, so if you want to get higher, like more precise things. Uh, you may make essentially type two error. So, uh, so the only way, this is a very important one, the only way to, so if, if you try to uh, essentially reduce type one error, you may actually come into type two error or vice versa. Because you may say, okay, I want to instead of 95%, I will go 99%. But 99%, it might be the case that this website is really <clears throat> better than the others, but now you don't have enough uh, uh, like the, the your test, your number say no, it is not significantly better. So this type one error and type two error, generally, if you try to improve one, you will make worse than that. There's only one way to reduce both of them. How? The way to reduce both of them at the same time is to essentially this central limit theorem that we mentioned. You try to increase the number of samples. But the issue is that the number of samples you will increase it. The problem is that it is costly. But the only way to get a better thing is that, I mean, that it makes sense essentially. You want to see whether your website is better, so then run it on more number of people, test on more number of people. And of course, these people should be independent. There should be no bias assessed on that one. Because otherwise, all of this assumption based on the fact that these are independent samples. If they are dependent samples or some biases which cause dependency or correlation, then it may break down. But if you can get, you want to see this website is better than that, put more customers there, more independent customers. Of course, if there is one customer, like you may add 10 million, I don't know. 10,000 customers, but all of them are affected by some news, then that is not necessarily give you the better because these are correlated. But if you can, or biased essential. So these are several factors that you need to work with it. You want to get more preciseness for hypothesis testing that this website is better than others, then the best way to reduce this type one, type two error is essentially to use uh, more samples. But the issue is that the samples are costly, so you may not be able to do it, I mean, uh, like lots of them. At the same time, even you increase it, you should be, make sure that there is no biases. There is no essentially correlation between these people, because that, again, it may uh, ruin your results. And this is the main idea that it is used in this big tech, essentially, that this is like, uh, so this is another thing that is the concept of causation is coming because causations and correlations are related. And this is essential. Causation can cause 
correlation, but not vice versa necessarily. But that is important because if these are, so you will see that this, the people are coming more to this website, to your new website. But the real thing is that this they are coming to this is because <clears throat> maybe a competitor website is dumb. That does not give that does not give you the idea that or that this is some item that is not available and you made it available in this particular website. Really, it's not better than the previous case, but because something some biases caused the issue. So you should try to remove biases that we So all of them are related. The number of samples versus I mean more better probabilities. And also you want to get this one independent. You don't want to get any correlation and there should be no biases or no causations or correlations. You want to remove them. And these are exactly the thing that you will go in the big tech. You are talking about it all the time. So there are also, as I mentioned, these test statistics. I mean, you may have one sample test. This is more like the Z test. And you may have a two sample test. Essentially, you will compare in two samples, experiment versus control or treatment versus control. This is more like the t-test essentially. Uh, so these are like, as I mentioned, so when you are comparing to a sample to the underlying population, I mean, these are some of the things actually, I mean, I may learn some of them essentially before when I was undergrad, but in the undergrad, of course, I mean, they may not talk that much about it. But as a, I mean, when I went to this big tech as a person working with them, he said, if you don't know this one in depth, means that you are uh, essentially illiterate, essentially. You don't know the language. You will come to this class, you don't know English, and you don't understand anything. So you need to go deep dive. And these are takes time, essentially. I cannot just cover everything. I want to say that these are super important. You need to spend time and go and read and see that there are lots of videos and also the things that you can read it. But in some sense, you just think about this. If you want to go for an interview, these are the topics that you should know well. So you should go and do, do more your research and see what are the examples, for example, of this kind of hypothesis testing that may come to in the, in the interview of, I don't know, company X. They always come in top companies. Like, unless this is some kind of a startup or something, they don't care. They just want to build something. But if they, some big companies, big tech, all of this is about this one. Uh, these are, as I mentioned, I, and I have seen this one is like at Amazon, at, I don't know, Google, Overstock, Uber, all of them, they are talking about this. Super, super important. These are at least observed and uh, needed to go and learn about them. Like uh, maybe I knew them before, but learning in depth is different. You should go, read it, see the examples, etc. And they cannot I mean, cover, of course, this one because just it's the introduction. Hopefully you should uh, see some of this in the later courses, like stats or others. But also that depends. Like the person who is teaching the stats maybe not <clears throat> being these big companies. The best way to get more information, the uh, vlogs essentially. Or videos. That's the, the best thing that you will go and they try to explain you in the best language for you. And you may need to try a few blogs. And as I mentioned, the, the best way for myself is that I will go there, I will say, oh, this website was good, this blog was good. I will always keep it, all of them in my email, in the studies of email about Python or other things, like A-B testing. I have all the videos or blogs in order. This is the best one. Maybe this is good also, this one. And some of them may not talk about all aspects, so you may need to have a several. But that's the way that you should go. But here I emphasize that this is super important. You will go to a company, you don't know that, it seems very bad. You can get essentially, also you can go more in depth, like in Wikipedia articles. These are the things that I mentioned. <clears throat> there are something about hypothesis testing, the history of it, the debates about it, criticism, etc. In particular, for example, there was this kind of, uh, there are some statistical errors. For example, this is the Nature article that said that p-value not as reliable as many uh, statistics assume because this is the one that is in fact is. He said that uh, essentially, if you have a p-value of 0 0.01, does not mean 99% of probability of the probability that the hypothesis being true. It is not that is not the meaning. 
And in fact, the probability of false alarm might be 11% or even higher. So what's the meaning of that? I mean, typically you will say, okay, I will get 0 0.01. I mean, that is means that the error will be 1%. But this is not exactly like this. These are like some kind of machinery that as a physicians they have developed. Now, uh, what is the thing? In practice, they are using this. Things like these are some of the papers that, of course, as statisticians, they are that's their job to bring, like essentially publish papers. So they will come and, and they, the whole idea is that maybe they criticize this such that they can find with a new method, actually, which is better, which is a good thing. I mean, all of this came out of research. They didn't come from essentially all of a sudden, they came out of research. So they are doing that. In practice, these are in use. And in some sense, that when you talk about when the p-value is 0.1%, the people generally mean 99% probability of the hypothesis being true. But it is in the worst case, it is not like. But the issue is that the worst case often does not happen in practice. Yes, you can create some worst case examples. But these are really, I mean, handmade essentially. Make it real world is a bit hard essentially. So this type of error, again, I mean, again, there are lots of discussion and debate, but currently, I mean, as a person who was inside her, these are the things that is in use, and the people are using it and base make the decision based on this in big big tech. So you should know about it, but know that, okay, yes, there are some special cases that this means not this essential. You can create this one, and these are the way that the statistician give papers, essentially. And again, they improve the science in some sense. These examples are good. You see, whether this example happens in other real world cases, how can we resolve that? And these are the new tools that are developed. Another thing, but this happens a lot. It's essentially called p-hacking. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is the one that they have. This this is something that you should be very careful because I mean this cherry picking especially is one thing that essentially happens more in academia. That happens like there are. Like, this is interesting. Lots of papers that you are seeing the influential papers in machine learning with the big data that comes from industry. The main influential. Paper. There are lots of people from academia, but they are more followers. Why? Because the companies, they are not giving the data to others. And not only that, it's not that they are bad that they are not giving. Uh, if they give it, I might not be happy because these are my private data. And we discussed about Netflix case that they gave it essentially, and somebody can do decode it and say, that, what are the movies that I like? I say, oh, uh, Professor Jagai is teaching this course. These are the list of movies that he likes. I mean, I may not be happy, or I don't know somebody may be happy. I don't know. It, but but, but uh, these are some of the privacy issues that we do violate. So they, they cannot easily give it. And even at Netflix, they have anonymized data and data. But just if somebody can, can come and decode it. So they, this data, they cannot give it. They have access to that. And in the big companies, it is much harder to do these tricks. At academia, you have much less data. So this is cherry picking. So you want to get p-values good? Just run the experiment a few times. And just one, oh, one, it was good actually. I can't just do that. This, if you do it in a company, you may lose the job next day. If they understand that you have done this. Because, I mean, you really don't want to make something. Yeah, you have an algorithm. You want to say that your algorithm is good. Then, then you will do cherry picking. You will just run it such a test. You will do this test from this test to next test, essentially, will be different. So in that case, if you want to change it and just run it again such that I can get the number that you want, then, of course, it might be not really good. And you just change the things such that you get a good number. And then you may lose quite a bit of money, and then they will find it. You would see less of this, not that you don't see at all, but I mean, because these are people, of course, academia versus this. So you cannot say these are completely different set of people. But you may see uh, more in academia, unfortunately, that they don't have access to data. They want to publish papers, and then they are just doing cherry picks. I have seen several of these. You will do it, run it such that you will get the result that you want. 
but in industry you will see less essentially and that's the thing that i mentioned they have access to data and it is more dangerous to do that so generally the papers that are coming from industry in this area of big data are more influential and i will say that i mean if you want to read some of these papers you may find the actual things in the paper that come from industry but again, these are the things that I want to mention. This is not like waterproof. There are like all sorts of hacking that you can do it, but you should not try to do it, especially if you are in the company or even in the academy. And the other thing that I want to talk about the biases, as I mentioned, this hypothesis testing, all of this, if there is some correlations, so this is essentially these biases, causations, correlations, all of them are the same categories in some sense. You will alter the data somehow, or this data that you will get, it is not. All of these are based on these things are lots of them. This is called frequentist method. Lots of them are based on the fact this central limit theorem. But if you do lots of independent cases, uh, this is a, like a one, again, one by one. This also comes from the normal distribution. What is the idea? So that if you, uh, for example, if you have a, a coin and then toss it 10 times, what is the chance that it comes like essentially five times head, five times, uh, you know, a tail? Okay, there is some chance that it comes there essentially, correct? But here note that when you run it five times, it might be just one time comes head, nine times six. So here, if you compute this mean essentially, it can be like anything essentially, it can be very uh, like, uh, like the confidence level is not high. However, just run this one like around, I don't know, 1,000 times. Then in 1,000, you will be much closer to 500 if you, in terms of absolute value. So like how much, like essentially the number of actual things that happens to five out of 10, so you are running it 10 times and then two times becomes head, the average was five. So the difference is three. But now run this one, on, uh, for example, 1,000. The ratio between this, maybe it's not 500, but 497. For you get a lot of concentration. All of these are based on the fact that we have no correlation. And again, I mean, there are actually some interesting things that people are working on it to think about it. Okay, you may have some correlations, but if it is a negative correlation, still it is fine. Uh, this is actually, uh, if you go to my life with Professor, I mentioned this one before, Professor uh, Arvind Sharanawasan, he's actually he's a professor here, and he's like more famous in randomized algorithm and probability. We had this one, and we are talking about negative correlation, positive correlation, etc., that you can actually get a very nice idea of what's the meaning of this. I mean, you cannot go through this one. This is not a stat class or probability class. In each of them, you can have their own class to talk about it, but you should have some ideas about it. And you should do it your own study and fully take more courses. This bias that all of them are based on the fact that these are independent or like say negatively correlated. But if they are positively correlated, then none of this is important. As I mentioned, so if uh, the people essentially the first person that use the website is some person is like Elon Musk, he's going and say, Oh, this website that I used this new the threads by Mark <laughs> Zuckerberg, this is not good. So then, of course, it has an effect on that one. These other people who are coming is not independent samples. So lots of these things that we are talking about, they don't work. In. So that's the thing that we try to kill this kind of biases, such that as much as possible, we can get independent. So uh, as I mentioned, so ideally, you want to get a random sample. Uh, if these are not random samples, random means independent sample generally. And generally, even the randoms, you can see even more <laughs> science of that. Even the random that you are using, RAND, I don't know, C++ plus plus or similar things at Python, they are not also producing completely random. This is the whole concept of pseudo-random generators. And you think they are random, but they are not actually random. <laughs> Generating a random bit is a very hard thing to do. And these are using some time of their things. For more practical purpose, they are good. 
but we are not quite random. So if you don't, I mean, you want to get uh, uh, essentially random samples, but if there is some bias that you don't get the independent or random. Random here is more like independent one. So here you need to be very careful when you try to do inferences from a sample. If this sample has some bias, then it doesn't mean that much. What these are some of the questions to ask? How was the sample selected? Was it truly random? What are the potential biases? We talk about the biases. How were questions worded? Because all of them they can actually have some effect. How is missing data or attrition handled? Was the sample size large enough? That is always one of the important things. So if you make the sample size large enough, it is something that prevents lots of error. But again, it is costly. You cannot easily make it. Like if this is at Amazon, there are 200 simultaneous uh, experiments that are running. It means that at the base, you can get one over 200 of the whole traffic. That may be not enough to infer essentially the thing. But this is the issue that, so in some sense, you can think about this one, that this data that you will get it, you should try to use maximum users out of it. And that's the thing that you try to somehow kill all biases. Maybe if there are some biases, try to essentially get this try to essentially take this sample as much as possible such that they are not biased. This is one thing that is used a lot is the clustering techniques. So what is the, cl the clustering technique is that you try to say that, okay, I want to get my samples to see whether this website is better, but I don't want to get all of them from the people in this class. Because the people in this class have some biases due to their background other things. So I want to cluster this class and make sure that from this class, I only get one sample. Maybe from other classes, other population, I will get this. These are all sorts of things that, again, lots of research you may think or think about it. This you will hear a lot in the company. How can we do the sampling, the clustering, such that from each similar cluster, I only have a limited number of So in some sense, yes, you may have a huge traffic from this class. But this doesn't mean that much because the result that you will get is not the real world. And note that we are talking about inferential statistics. I want to get something whether my new website is good for the whole world, not for this class. Does it make sense? So these are like very important that we should try to kill bias. And the sample size is very helpful, but again, you need to be careful about it. So these are some of the potential biases. You can essentially search about it. So there are some kind of sample bias. So for example, this is some selection bias. Some objects are more likely to be selected. Essentially this one, uh, uh, like volunteer bias. People are not, uh, uh, you may want to do something and then some people say we are volunteer for this one. But the issue that, yeah, these are the very good of those people. But they are not representative of the whole thing. I should not just use, oh, these guys are volunteers. Let me just use these things to do that. That is not necessarily, you may not get the best thing. You really need to work hard to get those people who don't want to be volunteers, maybe pay them, such that they give you the thing, such that you have a good sample. Uh, or non-responsive bias. So people who decline to be interviewed. So you need to really find these people and interview, pay them something to get it. It is costly to get a good thing. This is the other fun, it's the survey or response bias. So uh, interview bias. So interview interviewer, you want to, like I designed this algorithm. I try to put the system in a way that, uh, uh, for example, I mean, I think how many of you have seen this is a new thing that there are some polls that some of these YouTube videos at the beginning say, okay, which of these companies you like the best or something like this. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I should not say on the things and <laughs> video, but I mean, anytime I will just say one of them. I don't care. I don't read because I want to get it. So this is not a good one that like beginning of the video, you bring your things that I don't Think about it. You just give one of them essentially. I don't know how many of you are doing that or not, but I mean, what is the obligation? Why should I think about it? I mean, my time, the time of other people might be also 
important. So these are the things. So you should not get the data from me <laughs> or you should understand that I am doing this randomly. So you may say, okay, whether this guy think about it even or not, just do random the first thing essentially or the last one essentially. You need to filter this person from your understanding. And these questions you may do it, maybe based on these questions, I mean, or like somebody may design this, he, knew, he knows that the people who don't, <laughs> don't want to answer, they generally say the last or the first one, they have this data. So then the one that they want to get it, they will put it as the last question or the first question. So lots of them answer the first or last. They get, oh, you see, these people love this new thing. But really, that's it's not representative of this. It's called interview bias. Each of them you can go. This is uh, something called uh, acquiescence bias. So you may uh, uh, essentially, uh, this is the thing. So uh, like you will ask uh, these people, like you like to be good or you like to be bad. They know that this one, you like to, you want to see essentially that uh, you, so acquiescence essentially is the, the answer that the people think that the interviewer loves. So it's like, okay, I believe if I, I, if I say I want to be good, then this person loves me better or loves the good. <laughs> so you just say good. But really the person, if you think about it, maybe oh, sometimes I should be bad. Why should I be good? Or like, should I be all the time essentially, I mean, maybe a better example is that always I should, should I be, uh, should be patient or angry? Then the people say, yeah, I should be patient. That is a typical answer. But the people don't believe it. Sometimes you need to be angry. It is needed. But you don't get the answer that you want. A another one, this social desirability bias. I think this is the one that we talk about this 2016 election that like you will ask essentially the people, lots of people, I mean, like the, all these things that said, okay, uh, Clinton, wins the election, but Trump won. Because those people didn't mention that they voted for him, but they didn't want to mention it specifically the same. Yes. So these are all of this that you should consider. And this is the science of that. It's like social science and other things that you need to consider it. Otherwise, your poll does not mean anything. Or essentially anything that we are doing, A-B testing or hypothesis testing, everything means nothing, essentially. Another one, essentially, confirmation bias or... Uh, uh, Anchor bias. Anchor bias essentially is like a, so somehow you you know that this is the typical answer, and the people you will ask, and the people just answer you the typical answer, not the real answer. You can read about them, and these are all important. Like if you want to do A/B testing, you should do this one. Somehow in the big tech company, this becomes a bit less maybe because this is the concept of internet. You may have okay if you do enough clustering, you may be able to get around some of these issues because they are testing whether this website is better or not. And you are assuming that these people, this is the, essentially the idea beyond this, that you think that the two customers are not that much correlated with each other. This concept of bipartite graph that I have mentioned, that two, two customers generally are not that much correlated. The people who buy from them. It's not quite like that, but if, because if you say that this particular item at Amazon is like essentially causes cancer, the people, then, then of course it has it. But generally, they may not have that much effect on each other. So you may have less of them, but if you want to ask a survey about, like, I don't know, what would be the best way essentially to create a, a metro station? Where should we create such a metro station in the university? Then you, all sorts of things would be important. And again, I think this is like something I don't want to go through. This is a randomized clinical trial. I mean, this is like a gold standard essentially for this one. That you have essentially some new drug, you want to say whether this drug works or not. You have generally two things called treatment control. Treatment are the one that you are giving the new drug. Control are the one that you are just giving butter in stuff, essentially, the, uh, the actual thing. And you want to see what did happen essentially between these things. And you see all of these issues that I have mentioned are coming. And th so this is a typical example. When we talk about A-B testing, this is the one gold standard essentially that is coming essentially. 
clinical trial and this concept of you will hear also this is uh, the treatment versus control control means you don't change it the same algorithm as before treatment means you are changing the algorithm and of course in here for example control versus treatment you cannot just decide that to this guy i don't give you any a drug to this guy, I will give the drug. Because if it is the case, this guy, they know that they didn't give the drug or this one, that has the effect. So you need to give, make them very similar to get some kind of understanding. And this, but these are all things of things essentially that uh, it can be, each of these things to resolve it, it can be quite expensive. You cannot get a meaningful data easily. Because as I mentioned, the people, why should I try essentially? Why should be in this experiment? And if a, some portion of the community are not participating in your, for example, clinical trial, then that doesn't mean anything because there might be for some set of people, some ethnicity, it might be they are not that much <laughs> interested in this type of thing. They don't come and then you decide, oh, this is a very good drug and then you will use it really on those things and it can be disastrous consequences. All of them are very costly to get it. Uh, again, big tech versus clinical trial, these are a bit different, but both of them, they have their own difficulties. And one way or the other, you need to do some clustering and it is costly and this. And it's a lot of things that you can read about. Uh, another thing also about uh, causations, I wanted to say, I mean, if we talk about this, I mean, uh, causation, essentially this is some cartoon that you can, Think about it that uh, like there is some article, then it goes to the some news media and then becomes this, and then the people get some something causes something at the end, you will get this answer yourself that you didn't mean at all that was the consequence. But this causes this, this causes this, and essentially you get something completely nonsense out of the thing. So causation is very important. And again, causation is even super important, for example, in A-B testing. For example, I mean, an example, like you want to do it at Uber, you want to do that. You want to say whether really is the reason that there was this delay or this kind of, uh, essentially, the people, the driver didn't go there. But because of, I mean, there was some problem in the system, or there was some causes that this causes these other things and other things. You can, I mean, the, for the causation, there is this concept of confounding factors and others. And there's a lot of theory. So there's a lot of theory papers on it. And I'm, I mean, in person, it's not the, the most expert person in this area. There are lots of things that the people are just working on causations. And this is important, essentially. Again, some aspect of it became less relevant because of machine learning, because you only care about correlation and not causation, but not completely the case. The place that is still causation is very important is actually in the uh, A-B testing. And the people want the people who know about causation. I mean, essentially, this is the uh, determining causations. Uh, this is uh, from uh, uh, Bradford Hill criteria. This is something like uh, widely accepted in modern era as a useful guidance for investing with their causality. Is like correct or not? So essentially, these are some criteria that you can check. But we don't really, when you say, because even the definition of causation is not that in, that clear. You want to say this causes that. You should understand what is the meaning of that. So for example, you say that a, st a strength. So if you say this causes that, because it might be the case, again, there might be both of them are correlated, but none of them causes the other one. Like you go have ice cream does not cause us that you will go to pool or vice versa. But... If the, if the weather is warm, then it can cause it. So causation is a non-trivial thing. It's not, I mean, how large is the strength? So if this is the case, whether it is just slightly, okay, yeah, this guy had the ice cream and then went to the pool. Is it really because of that? How strong is that? Uh, consistency across different samples. With a different sample, all people who go, essentially have ice cream, then go to pool or not? Or no, sometimes this happens. How specific, what, I mean, what are the scenarios or? So one important thing, if you say something is cause of the other, <laughs> this should come before the other. So if the people sometimes half of the time, they are, go to the pool and then have ice cream and then half of the time have ice cream and then go to the pool, 
It means that none comes before the other. Causation generally one should come before the other. Very important. Biological gradient. If you increase the dose, whether the increased association, if you are, I don't know. You can just think about it like about this ice cream versus going pool, essentially. Uh, whether if the people have more ice cream, then go to the pool more. Yeah. A plausibility, uh, coherence, experiments. Uh, I mean, con uh, considerations of alternate explanation. So you can essentially go and read about each of them. And again, I want to say that causation is very important. You may hear it in the interviews or actual job. And these are like some of the things that you need to know more about. And again, you may, this is an area that we can have essentially a few sessions of a graduate course just talking about causation. We don't have the time there. Hopefully you may hear some of them more in the stat courses or other things. But you need to go at the end of the day and learn from the web, blog, chat, GPT, et cetera. Uh, but, but I will say these are actually important. This is the example that I have mentioned. For example, why this is important? Because sometimes you will go there, so you know you have some ideas what is the things that are important and you should do that. This was the case that I created a website, and I mean, and this uh, website, first I used general uh, JS file and HTML. The quality was not that great. Then I have done a lot of research on the web, etc. I say, okay, Bootstrap is a good one. And uh, they put a strap versus React. I say, okay, that's it. And if you read it from the website, everyone says, oh, these are both good and you can use one of them. Not one is the better one. Okay. So I use Bootstrap. Then I just actually, after some time, say, oh, I want to change it. Then I cannot change it easily. Understood? Oh, if you want to create it, actually, the React, the correct one. But this actually came to me after I could confirm some kind of inside information with some people, the top company. Oh, actually, they are using React. I learned, but in a like very painful way because I spent maybe I don't know six nine months to create all all of these things, such that I understood at the end I should do it React. So at the beginning, if I knew the React one, I just used React and it had a very reusable thing. That's exactly the idea that we are using here. Yeah, you may say, oh, you are not going to the details. You are talking about it, but this is the important say that it, this. For example, this concept of bias, you should know that these are some of the things. Causation is very important. You want to go with this, you need to read about it. And these are some of the from the industry experience, like top tech industry. That's the reason that again I'm teaching this course because I want to transfer my knowledge on this. I have seen this one in the big industry. That's the reason that I'm telling you. It's not just arbitrary text that I we have it here. No, these are like very useful ones. You should improve your knowledge about this concept because this will be used and you will be asked. Different companies might be different, but almost all of them, like if you go to Facebook, you need to be very good essentially on this kind of stat, uh, hypothesis testing and other stuff. They don't hire you if you are not good at it. Again, different companies may be a little bit less or more weight on that, but they are very important. Last but not least, about this part about misuse of statistics. That is very important. I mean, the people can, this is the thing that I mentioned. You can always interpret data in a completely different thing. This is a famous book, old book that uh, on statistics goes into, uh, I mean, this is on the, essentially about the statistics, and says that how to lie with statistics. You can actually convince the people. Let's give just one example. I think you can see lots of other examples here. So this is actually a very interesting example. So no, I want to uh, say this one. The people, number of drivers in fatal crashes. Good. I have it the ages, 16 to 19, 20 to 24, 25 to 29. I, this is the number. From this number, say, oh, these people 20 to 24, these are the most careless drivers. You should put you should put much more restrictions for these people. Like as a policeman, if I see a person between twenty two and twenty four, by default is a guilty person because they um, they are like less care. They are more careless people, and they cause lots of fatalities among themselves, probably among others. If I see that person, I should give tickets to that by default. However, this is completely wrong. Why? Because yes, they have done this one, but the actual thing that you should do it 
is this one. You should, this is another thing. Fatal crashes per 100 million miles driven. You should see how much the people are using these things essentially. Yes, these people are have more crashes, but because they are using much, much more, they drive much, much more compared to the other people. Now you will do the things. Then you will see actually a very realistic one. Who are the people who have caused the problem 16 to 19? And the people, uh, elderly people, I mean, that's again, everyone becomes hopefully an old person uh, if continues, if the life continues. So all of us become, but yeah, I mean, your eye may not see it well. Your, I mean, uh, brain may not be as sharp as when you are young. And so on and so forth. So these are the people that have caused more fatalities and you should put more restrictions on them essentially. 16 to 19, which is generally it is the case. 16 to 18, you have restriction, you cannot go overnight or something. I think for 17, for like this kind of senior citizen, there are less restrictions. Again, I don't advocate you should put it or not because I may become old at some point and I want to drive. Uh, but this is the case essentially. So this is the more realistic. And you see, I can convince you really by this one. Is, I don't lie about the numbers. These are the real numbers. I just, just, and the only way is to think deep dive into that. You see, this you are presenting, but this is not the important one. And this is exactly the thing. Like in a company, this may happen. The people say, okay, this is like the things, and this is better than that. And A-B testing shows that this is the case. But you need to say essentially, no, this one that they are mentioned, there are some other factors that you need to consider. It. Can we test and check it essentially? And this is only can happen by testing because this is, I mean, from this to, from the first one to the second one, the only way is that, I mean, you deep dive essentially and think what are the factors that probably is missing such that you can guess this. Another thing, for example, you say that proportion of head injuries rises in cities with bike share programs. This is the thing they have done it in uh, like uh, Washington uh, Post essentially has this one in the Washington state. I mean, some researchers from there say that if you have bike share, then you have more, uh, but you have more essentially heading. And the people are getting this paper published in nature. They have all motivations to do that. And again, not necessarily a bad motivation. Sometimes they don't consider all factors. They may miss some of the factors. So, uh, what is the things essentially? You may think about it. I mean, there are you can read about it. I don't want to go through that. But this is the whole thing that is essentially the thing that you can mention. Uh, you can see that I mean, due to these changes, essentially, actually, when they've had it more bike share, essentially, actually, the uh, head injuries declined from three nineteen to two seventy three. That overall injuries is also declined from 757 to 545. So head injuries went down, overall injuries went down. But the catch is that overall injuries went down much more. Now, if you compute here, this is the first two numbers, the ratio of the first two numbers, the head injuries is actually larger than the head injuries here, the fraction. Sorry, the, the fraction is smaller. So in the first case, the head injury, so the, the people are using more fraction essentially. As a result, the head injuries went down. Also overall injuries went down. Why? Because the people doing less drive, etc., less causality because of that, then they don't hit the pedestrian or other essentially. Everything went down. But the catch is that, Everything here, the overall event with a higher slope comparing to head injuries. Then this guy said, oh, you see, the percentage of the head injuries went up. But that does not tell you the whole story because this is not the case. Actually, it went down. Yes, the percentage went up because it uh, causes other fatal injuries going much more down all sorts of things that you can think about it and these are like very interesting so the whole idea is that you should not be fooled 
by stats essentially. You really need to think about it very truly. And there is no other way than training, essentially the thinking. This is the way essentially that you can be much better than chat GPT. Again, I cannot say five years from now, but at, at the moment. Chat GPT cannot do this type of thing. Uh, yeah, there are, I mean, there are other examples that you say that there are like 80% of dentists recommended Colgate, but they don't say that this 80%, they only consider it, for example, at UK, not the overall thing. Again, so these are the things that we talk about, some basic uh, statistics. We talk about uh, some uh, resources, essentially, for you. You didn't have the quiz this time. And then we are talking about uh, some uh, statistical techniques and ML structures. So the next the next part of the course that we are having today, we talk about, we quickly go through several ML algorithms and the, what are the practical aspects of it and so on and so forth. But again, you will have another course in machine learning that you will go deep dive. But hopefully these are the things that I mentioned again, these are coming from the industry. So then some of them might be more useful than the one that you just hear essentially just in academia. Again, this would be good for deep dive analysis. But this might be more essentially might be already good for if you want to do some practical things. Uh, okay, so uh, now we are talking more. Uh, so, so far, I mean, this we have this kind of a statistical model that we are creating, or this kind of machine learning algorithm. They are, in some sense, they have similarities and have been used interchangeably uh, among these things. So let's define some uh, key terms. Uh, yeah, yeah, supervised versus unsupervised learning. So this you are hearing a lot. In the supervised learning, we are giving, uh, I mean, uh, supervised means that we are giving the labels, essentially, the correct labels. So in the uh, so uh, we want to uh, essentially in the supervised things, it is the case that you are given some kinds of like x and y, and you are given so x is a vector essentially x one x two to x n. You can kind of think about the features essentially, and then from them you want to predict y. And then generally some training samples is given to you that are labeled. You want to learn such that you can apply for the rest of the data. Like for classification, for example, this is a typical example that people actually are doing competition on that. That you are giving some kinds of handwritten digits and you need to say which digit is that. So you know the correct thing that you need to do essentially better than the state of the art. Or in the regression, you want to essentially predict the stock prices. That's the typical thing. The other one is essentially unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning, I mean, here you don't have a labeled data. You have unlabeled data. And a typical example, I would say even unsupervised learning in one, in some sense is mainly clustering. You said, I mean, the clustering you want to cluster the some of the people. There is no wrong or right or wrong, or there is no label that which things should be there. You just you can define some metric, and then according to this metric, you want to say how good is your class. So there are uh, uh, other things, for example, uh, in the latter, that uh, you may want to do the dimensionality reduction. That's another thing that uh, you have a set of data, and you want to, for example, I, I don't know, you know like, 100 dimension. You want to show to the people to get some idea. And how do you map from that to two dimension? This is something that you can actually use a lot. And it is can be applicable a lot. Uh, in some sense, it is uh, some sort of clustering as well. That's like you want to cluster the points nearby, essentially, nearby here. So in some sense, it's also is some kind of clustering like this. Uh, I mean, this is another one, association uh, rule mining. That, I mean, essentially say that if you buy A, then you buy B. There's no, again, mm, labeled in a the sense there. This is another example. 
Uh, you may have a semi-supervised learning, which is a combination of labeled and unlabeled data. That you may say is called semi-supervised. But generally, you will say supervised versus unsupervised. And unsupervised, it is clustering or similar problem to cluster. Uh, so you have this uh, concept training versus testing data set. So generally you get the whole data. This data, you will divide it into 80% train, 20% test to see which model works the best. And then when you have it, then you may use it for your future data or online data when you have the model. Feature selection. Feature selection is very important that I mentioned. So you may have X1, X2, to Xn, and this is the Y, essentially, for that. These are the columns that you have. Each of these columns is a feature. Okay, if this is, this is this item has color red, and the price is this, then the people will click on it. And the click on it, it would be Y equal to one or zero. So in that case, the issue is that maybe the color is red is not that important. You generally try to find the important features that they are predictive of their bias. One thing which is used a lot is called Shapley value. So this Shapley value essentially becomes like some concept from game theory that has been used now. It's called Shap, essentially. Shapley value search it. It's a Python thing for that, essentially. That this is something each of these, whenever we talk about the models, you can actually check with them and then Shapley value for each feature, say how important is that feature? Those that are not that important in the predictions, then you may, you may actually remove them and you may get a better results. Why? Because these guys, I mean, they are adding some noise to the thing. So you try to predict, but maybe a little bit red and blue cause the problem. But if you remove this color, then you get a much better thing. That is the thing that is, so it's not monotone that if you get more data always you get better. This is the idea also about uh, based on the essentially neural nets. So neural nets essentially or deep nets are based on this. So this feature selection is super important. They, in some sense, they try to, uh, I mean, this is a new model. I mean, we talk less about that. You may have some courses on that and there's a whole, all new things that we can get it about neural nets. We cannot cover a lot in this course. We talk a little bit at the end of the class, essentially, but when we talk about some kind of embedding techniques. But in general, about the neural nets, the issue is that these features, they, this is the whole idea that you may get this one, you don't know which features are important. Even this feature that you collect, you may not know which one is important. Especially this is more become more important. For example, if you want to say some handwritten things is written, like for example, this is six. Correct? Or this is, I don't know. This is nine, for example. So this is you will see this one and you should say nine. This is like more graphic things that you can get it. The people don't know what are the features in this. For something like, for example, click through rate or conversion, there are some some more reasonable things as a feature. But here, even you don't know what are the features. This is the whole idea of the deep nets that you form a network, a graph, that each node of this one is somehow corresponding to some feature that you don't know what is it. You will give the whole things to the computer. I say computer figures out what are the features and what are the importance of each feature. That's somehow the, this feature selection is a super important thing that actually cause the whole deep learning because especially for graphics and others still the people this kind of feature selection this type of Shapley value the people are using it when they are working click to rate or other things essentially in the recommendation system that's very important uh, or conversion rate essentially that is still used but for some others like for example for uh, voice for for example uh, graphics etc images that actually neural nets works much better. Because you don't know what are the features. You may see, okay, the, the voice is this or that, but these are somehow, that's the thing that essentially, especially for natural language processing as well, that has been used a lot, this type of uh, neural nets, and they give a very good results. Because we as a human, we don't know what are the exact features, what are the features, 
and what are the weights of each of them and what are the importance. So, so sometimes there is a concept of natural feature, sometimes there is no feature. So feature is very important and that's the main uh, aspect in which, uh, like for example, neural nets are good in creating the features. What is the problem there? Interpretability. This is the issue that, for example, I mean, you can use a neural net for self-driving cars. This is one of the issues that exists like essentially. They, they thought that actually given the neural net, given the advance in ML, um, I had actually a student was working at uh, Uber back in like, I think 90s, like 2017. I think they were talking on like, there was some news also at uh, Uber that by, by 2019, they were thinking that they have self-driving trucks, not cars, self-driving trucks, even. But I think 2020, 2021, they sold the whole technology to, I think uh, Aurora is the company that is there, we can search that. They sold the whole thing to them, so that we don't want to work on it anymore. The problem is not that easy to solve. And there are some advances. I mean, some people said we have advances, we cannot do it. But I mean, at the moment, one of the main issues is about interpretability. Because if you want to use the neural nets, yeah, 95% of the time everything is good, but sometimes you may kill essentially a person. And actually, this is the thing that happened with Uber. If you remember, that was a few years ago that was a Uber driver, a Uber self-driving car hit a person on the bike that is a bike that was passing a road kill that person, you can search about it. I think that was the main thing that actually after that, shortly after that, they sold the whole technology to a startup. I mean, it's like Aurora is the company. I think they have a share in Aurora. This, because this one, if it does not work, you don't know why it does not work. These are this, uh, in the self-driving car, these are the aspects of feature selection, you will think about it. But the issue is that the feature selection, the issue is that generally you need a lot of also computation time that you may not have it available for a car. You may need to do all these things. A car does not have a cloud to do that. And you cannot send it to the cloud because if at some point it is disconnected from the cloud, then there would be crashes. So these are like important thing, aspects of, these are the things that you will see different aspects of machine learning is essentially is going becoming important or not. But this, uh, especially um, interpretability is one of the most important things currently at machine learning, especially about neural nets. Good. There, there's this concept of regularization. Regularization, you will hear a lot. Essentially, we try to simplify the solution produced by a technique by penalizing complexity. What's the meaning of that? For example, you, this is the regularization. You will put it, you don't uh, want that. I mean, the system is like very too comp. If you want to find a line or something that describes it, you don't want that like the noises or something causes that these uh, coefficients are going up and down such that they cancel each other. How can you do that? For example, you will put uh, some kind of penalty that these coefficients, if they are large, that is part of your objective function and you want to minimize. So if these coefficients are too large, that they cause that the objective function is just too high and that would be not a very good solution anymore. You want to have I mean, reasonable things such that they are not just increasing, decreasing coefficients when you try to learn, such that they cancel out for your things, but generally it is a very complex model. You don't know what is happening in the real world. This is very similar to overfitting essentially. There is this concept of underfitting and overfitting. Underfitting is that I mean, your model, you do it. It cannot predict it well. Overfitting is that it, especially on the training data and even sometimes on like even training data and even test data sometimes, you can train this one such that you can get almost exact any solution that you will really get, get the answer. But the issue is that this uh, model really didn't, so this is the whole idea. When you do overfitting, you generally want that this machine learns uh, the intuition behind this. Sometimes this, essentially, this uh, uh, like model just learns the whole XY things, essentially. 
like if these are the exegesis of high, this is like does not understand the intuition essentially. And this is the concept of overfitting. Overfitting happens is that essentially, literally, you know that for this example that you gave, it's what should be the answer. But if you give, what is the problem? You will give a new answer. If uh, like, this is somehow essentially somehow compared to the things. I can give like some problem, I mean, that you can solve this one, and then you are very good at solving this problem. But if you didn't get the whole intuition about it, then in the exam, you may have a problem because this is this completely different set of problems. And this is the issue that essentially is happening with overfitting. That, uh, and this is also related to this regularization. When this model becomes too complex, you, you try to essentially learn this one, it puts coefficients in a way that always get the exact answer that it wants. It does not really understand what's going on, it just put the, some kind of equations to get the answer that it wants. However, I find I'm fine to, that is exactly, that's the thing is called overfitting. It, it, the error is almost zero. I don't want such a thing. I want that it has some reasonable error, not that if it is too low, it becomes underfitting, but some reasonable model, but this, he, it got the intuition such that it uses on the future data that I don't have it. But that you will hear overfitting, underfitting a lot, and regularization is something that helps essentially for overfitting to make it essentialist. But the one key challenge for data scientists maybe, I mean, a few years ago, was to choose which method or algorithm to use for a specific But I would say nowadays is not the case. So what is the thing that is happening? We are talking about the different algorithms. At the moment, it is not like that. So the idea is that if you have a data, you will give this data to, uh, you need to just have, a, say, a Amazon Atagluan or similar thing. Maybe Google has some similar thing, but Amazon Atagluan is one good example of that. And the people are using it in the industry. They will give the whole data to Amazon Atagluan. This essentially runs different models for you. Not only that, all of these models, they have something called hyperparameters. For example, we talk about the forest, number of trees, depth of the trees, all of them are things. If you want to do it by hand, you need to try everything. But you just give it to that so that try all possibilities. It takes time, but you don't care that much at this point. Why? Because at the end of the day, it comes, okay, this seems the best model for you. Good. Then you know that which one works the best for your data, you will get that one. And you will just, even sometimes you know this, for example, XGBoost or others that we will talk about it, that works well. But that finds the hyper, good hyper parameters for you, initial hyper parameters for you. Then you will slightly, change it to essentially fine tune it for your purpose and your demonstration. So this is currently the state of the art for lots of these things that if you don't know how the data, just give it that one. You just give the whole table, the whole data that, and then it figures it out. It takes time, but I mean, who cares? Like you want to, instead of you spending time to these things, they are here. And that's, of course, the, the question is that then they need less data scientists because they can always they can do that and they can save them. Anyhow, so what are the models? These are the general models. I mean, again, the, the, there are neural nets that, uh, so, uh, uh, so there are neural nets that we don't cover it yet. We talk a little bit at the end of the class and there are some other courses. It's like, you need to have a whole course. I cannot talk about it. These are some of this about the linear regressions and others that you can also learn more about it. So here, the, this is the linear regression is a typical thing that probably the first important things that you want to predict the value of the dependent, a value of a dependent, which is, can be a response outcome of uh, like essentially a model uh, using one or more independent or explanatory variables. So in short, it is like you are given x1, x2, to xn, and this is the y. So this is uh, this is the first row. And you have lots of these rows. And you want to say that if I give you the, this one, give me the y. That's the same. Essentially, you try to learn a function, a multivariate function. And these are the input ones. And this is the output, the output or outcome or response. For and we are assuming that this relation should be linear equations. So there are lots of these things essentially there. Then uh, the question that when you want to do that, what should be the objective function? The one that they are putting using, it is called OLS. 
an ordinary least square, we try to minimize the square distance from the line. But we can define again two types of things. For example, from this point, you may define this as a distance or you may define this one. But generally, this is a more typical way or easier way, essentially, that we, because the computation for this might be a bit harder. Then you try to minimize the sum of these guys, essentially, and that's the objective function. Interestingly, lots of them actually you can solve it with linear programming. Yes. But linear programming and the techniques of this linear regression and others are very correlated with linear programming. They are using some of this. You can read more about it. And this is comes in uh, uh, rich regression that you are adding a penalty term for size of the coefficient. This is something of regularization that I have mentioned. So you want to find the linear relations. So it means that essentially, what is the linear relation? We talk about it in linear programming. That essentially you have C1x1 plus C2x2, so on and so forth, uh, that this is the y comes in. And you try to find these coefficients. In the rich regression, uh, you can actually put a penalty term plus, like for example, absolute values of this C1 plus C2 plus this. This causes that this, then the size of this coefficient should be not larger. And so that essentially comes less uh, overfitting and also less complex model. Here, I mean, the linearity assumption is only about the parameters. What's the meaning of that? It means that you can do all sorts of transformation that you have it. So here, for example, you have C1 times some function of x to the 2. So you see, this is the whole idea that C1 times x to the 2. Here, it's, it's C1 times x to the 2 is something that you computed. You, see, you can consider x to the 2 as a new variable. I don't know. Maybe uh, alpha. Do you have this row? You just put it x to the 2 there new uh, <clears throat> feature it calls alpha, which is x to the two. It's still, I mean, you can have it. This is one thing that is very useful is log. Lots of the time, if you are working, this is some of this is a thing which is important. If you have the numbers, you want to use log. Log helps a lot. Why? Because if you see between zero and one, the number between zero and one, or like better say, number between the difference between one and two, it's not the same as the difference between 10 and 11. It is more like the difference between 10 and 20. That's the reason that if you take log, then 1 and 2 would be two different things. And then one, 10 and 20 would be different. Like 10 up to 19, all of them would be like 10. Log generally helps a lot. So whenever you have this bar, it will essentially you are doing the, you are taking log. The other thing that helps a lot is this uh, called one-hot encoding. What is one-hot encoding? So essentially, try to, instead of working more with the numbers, you just try to do it between zero and one. That helps a lot. This is another technique which helps a lot. For example, I mean, you want to say that, like, one of your features is that which day of the, which day of the week. For example, you want to see whether the click goes up or down. Which day of the week? That's a very important. You can put, use the number one to five, or I don't, one to seven for that. First day, second day, third day, and so on. I think the first day would be actually Sunday. If do that, and then Monday, and so on. But this generally does not give you a very good answer. The way uh, that works much better, if you do that, if you put a feature called Monday, zero or one, is day Monday or not? So the day for each of these five days, you are putting a different feature. And then each of them would be zero one. The whole idea is very similar to these large things. These models are much more sensitive to zero one. For them, uh, this is exactly the same thing that I have mentioned for log. Why do we take log of these numbers? Because really, four and five is not that different for that model. But zero and one generally for the function that we are putting is a bit different. And if there is some difference between zero and one, like this, that model can understand, yeah, in Mondays, the click would be less. I don't know, the people will be less busy. So two important things that it will be used a lot, uh, one hot encoding, and essentially taking logs. These are very similar to each other. Uh, log of the numbers. 
that can help a lot to get a better model. Uh, lots of these things, again, uh, Amazon Autogluon can do that. For example, if there are the dates, et cetera, if you say that, you can try and even one hot and quote them. Some of them you need to say that if the data does not know, but some of them it knows essentially. Generally for dates, do one hot encoding. That's very important or time or something. This one hot encoding, as, as long as, as soon as you can do one hot encoding, do that. Or if you want to take a log, do that. This tool will help the model. This is a very important thing. So this essentially, if the predictor variables are not independent, the whole model breaks down, essentially. I mean, maybe not completely break down, but you don't get the thing. So that is the thing. The feature that you are trying to do that should be as independent as possible. Uh, because in some sense, you may work with, like, it, this is the thing. So if you have x1, x2 to xn, and from this, you try to get n, y, if these features are good, you can get a lot of information, such as you do the y correct. However, if it turns out that x1, x2, all of them are just a multiplication of x1, it means that they are dependent. So in some sense, just from x1, you would try to get y. So all of them are somehow irrelevant, does not give you any information. That you should try to avoid this kind of dependence. Uh, so here we talk about about a regression. Regression was the meaning of regression. Generally means that you try to get predict some stock. As I mentioned, the the, the price of a stock market, this particular stock. You try to get quantitative things. Classification is the one that is used essentially when we are using the label data, or uh, we call it essentially um, what type of data at the beginning. But no, we had two type of data. Uh, the other one was not quite categorical data. For categorical data works very well. Classification mainly goes about categorical data. Is it like high risk versus low risk? Generally in the categorical, we make it also zero one. There are some models that they are working zero one two, but generally yes or no is the name. Uh, so you are given a features and some of the labels, you try to learn model to use the future data points. And this, uh, these are labels are categorical, not numerical. Uh, and as I mentioned, for numerical features, visualization can help, but generally uh, this kind of log will help us. So these are like different classification algorithms essentially exist here that we want to talk about it. And uh, one very important one are decision trees. Decision trees essentially, these are the features that you have. For example, you have weather, humidity, wind, etc. These are based on these features. You want to say that you are going to, I don't know, swimming or not, for example, or something else. So you say, according to the weather, if it is rainy, cloudy, or sunny, if it is cloudy, you may go. If it is rainy, it depends whether there is a wind or not. If there is a weak wind, yes, you may go. But if it's a strong wind, you are not going. Or humidity. Humidity, for example, if humidity is normal, you will go there. But maybe it's just too high, you are not going there. This is, uh, this is very intuitive and easy to use. And it is very interpretive. It is exactly the reverse of neuralness. Because you will tell everyone, you will understand this one. I said, this is based on this, I can predict what is that. It works both for categorical and numerical features. So the only thing is that generally this decision tree is only one tree is that. The one tree might be not enough to give everything that you want. That's the reason that you are doing random forest, which is not one tree, a set of trees. And this is basically a collection of decision trees. So this is essentially this decision tree works very well in practice. You can do that. And there are lots of families of them that are essentially the use. The first one is random forest. Random forest is a very good algorithm and works quite well. There are two more uh, advanced ones. This is, these are currently a state of the art. XGBoost and LightGBM. How many of you heard about LightGBM? 
What about the XG boost? So these are like XG boost and light GBM. These are all of them again are in Amazon Auto Glue huh? or Auto ML. The XG boost, these are generalizations of those uh, essentially forest things or like forest essentially. It is um, random forest etc. They are doing this one plus gradient. This boost is it comes from gradient descendants that you compute essentially the shape of these trees and the depths of them according to some kind of optimization. And they also, they essentially, uh, uh, this is the um, auto boost plus this kind of decision trees. So this Adoboost is the first one. What is the idea of Adoboost? This is actually, how many of you heard about Adoboost? Yeah, Adoboost actually is a very famous uh, algorithm. So this is the idea again comes somehow from this central limit theory. The idea of concentration. He said that how oh, you can learn from weak learner, a strong learner. What is the idea again? This weak learner, if they each of them are zero, one, if you get a large number of them, it is a concentration. It tells you what is the truth. All of them are using this fact that if you have independent values, zero, one, if you have a good number of them, you take the average, you are very concentrated on the correct result. This is actually um, this, uh, founded by, I mean, uh, Rob Shapiro. Uh, he's uh, now actually he was a professor at Microsoft at Princeton, and now he's at Microsoft Research. Uh, I had a live with him, and he was talking about it. It's actually a very good one to watch that one. It gives you very good ideas about how do they develop and what are the different things that he has it. So just go and I mean see a Rob Shapiro. I don't uh, just search essentially in my YouTube videos. You will find. Anyway, so this Adobe is essentially this concept of weak learner versus strong learners. Plus this decision tree. This when you combine it, this is these are the different algorithms like XGBoost or LightGBM. And this XGBoost is okay with outliers. Outliers, it is there. So some of this you need to, if there are some outliers, need noise. If the noise, it doesn't matter, the noise will be removed. It works for non-standardized features, essentially. Any feature that you will get it, I mean, get some reasonable results. Of course, you can optimize more. Okay, with collinear uh, feature. So if one is the like all of them were next one is like as a linear with the other one is related doesn't matter it works it's an amazing algorithm amazing learning things if there are some non values in python none is non non known essentially it doesn't matter it finds it there is another version of that it's a bit i mean like gbm this is also okay with nand it is work for the categorical the, the main things about it is faster than after training than XGBoost, it is much faster by GBM. I don't say maybe often, but sometimes works better than XGBoost, not all the time. And this is exactly the one that you can just give it actually to Amazon and so say just optimize over this. Both of them are the state of the art industry, XGBoost and Light GBM. You, you should use them. These are especially, I mean, these are, of course, different than neural nets. The neural nets, you can't do it, but neural nets, they have some of their particular application that they have it. For example, they have the applications, I don't know, about the natural language processing or vision, etc. They are good. These are the things that are, like, if we don't know the features, then this guys works well, neural nets. If we know the feature, natural feature, this one works much better. Or at least, it, it, you need to take much, much more time to get a good neural net that can work as good as this one or improve. I cannot say that it does not exist, but it takes a lot more. So the people generally will be happy by this single feature. I think which feature, and this one, for example, I mentioned this Shapley value, you can use this Shapley value on top of them and say that sometimes you can actually, I work with some of this algorithm, I, I remove some of this feature, see whether it works better or not. Sometimes you can get actually some improvement. By removing some of this feature. But it is hard to for XGBoost actually that you will remove some of the features and get a better one because it's very smart. This is some of the things that the people may discuss less essentially in academia. Some papers, I think 2016, if I remember, or something like this, that the first paper of this appeared. 
So IGBM is more recent event, but I think Microsoft, well, some people at Microsoft developed this. Uh, you don't hear that much at academia about them, or much less. That is a state of the art. Like if you talk somebody, say which algorithm, you know that you don't know XGBoost, you don't get the job. These are like very important things to me. Good. Uh, so this is another thing which is uh, uh, like essentially important is logistic uh, regression. Logistic regression actually is a classification algorithm. Is it especially good? I mean, like, it, it is not a regression. Regression is more, more quantitative things. This one is more categorical data. But the good thing is that it, I mean, the function that is doing essentially f of t, so essentially f of x, in the simplest case, if you have x and y, <clears throat> f of t, it gives some probability distribution between 0 and 1. So it does not. Uh, so you can get the categorical data if the probability is greater than half would be one, otherwise would be zero. So you can round it. However, the good thing is that, for example, for probability of click, you want to compute the probability of click or conversion. In that case, you really need a probability more than whether it clicks happens or not. This is a very good one. This is essentially if you have if you have features x, y, and z, essentially, you can. It is more general. It is this function. It's called sigmoid function. It's also used essentially on lots a lot in neural nets as well, or some version of this tan and other things essentially. Uh, that uh, you can actually use it, but generally the, the, some versions of this also used in neural nets. These are like these functions are used a lot in neural nets to turn essentially. <clears throat> Uh, as I mentioned, it, it is very useful when you want to get the probability of click versus this. And this, like whether you want the click happens or not, maybe it's not that important, uh, like the zero one is not important. Is that what is the probability? Because this probability, you will use it in some other things, whether you want to see which ad. <clears throat> uh, this probability of click is very important in the advertisement action. This is, again, if you want to know more about it, just see some of these potentials of e-commerce we are talking more about. Uh, and here from this, essentially this is the idea from this C1, C2, C3, this one, this is this stigma function, this C1, C2, C1, we can learn from the coefficients. Another, uh, I mean, algorithm here is called support vector machine. This was actually before this XGBoost or like GBM, that was like a state of the art. For lots of this, this algorithm worked very well. It was very popular. So what is the idea is that, I mean, if you have two sets of data, they try to find this vector, which is somehow equally distance from the minimum here and maximum here. These two called the support vector, and this is generally try to find some support vectors that separate this, that this is like some end of this one and the other one, the beginning of this. And this try to find goes exactly in the middle. These two distances generally are, this generally are, this is called uh, support vector machines. This is not just a line, you can have a hyperplane. Again, SVM is one of these that you can just, all of them are, all of these models are have a packages essentially. You will just, this is the model that I want to use it. Just ask, ask ChatGPT, it gives you exactly the model that you should run. Uh, but you want to see which one you want to run it, go to Amazon Autogluon. And again, these are like the software. I will say that use Windows, for example. Use, uh, I mean, that <laughs> this you should be able to learn use windows. Uh, so this auto gluon is like, essentially you need to go, what is the input output? You just do it. Give it to auto gluon. It finds which one is the best and then you can use it. Sometimes SVM actually works good, but it was used more before this kind of neural nets and even XGBoost and stuff. I mean, for me, history. Linear regression is especially good. Even now is very fast. The people are using it for some of these predictions of, for example, they want to show some ads. You want to see whether you click or not. The still linear like, uh, regression actually is used on those because this is very fast. And as I mentioned, so if you if they show you some advertisement, you need to they need to compute very fast, like in 20 milliseconds, that which ad they should show to you. 
there it is important. The time is important. They cannot have a very complicated model to decide whether they should see this ad or not. They want a fast method. And that linear regression works very well. SVM or others are not as fast as this. But anyhow, so this is the idea. So for this red and white and black ones, you want to find essentially two lines. And then somehow the middle guy, which is equal distance from buffer. So this is the maximum margin between these two guys. Uh, so here there are something like essentially, what about if these two classes are not linearly separable? So in that case, you may have some kind of penalty. Say that, oh, if this guy is going the other way, not the correct way, then you should pay essentially, uh, so you can, you're allowed to do mislabel, but there is some penalty essentially. Mm. And there are I mean, ways to do that. One other thing that is used a lot, this is also some transformation. This is a typical thing that you will see that SVM. That, I mean, sometimes you see if these points, if you are looking them, if you point, see this point, these are not separable. You cannot do it with a hyperplane or line, essentially. You cannot separate them. How can I do that? You can do some transformation. X and Y, it will go to this one. In uh, instead of in two dimension, you are going to three dimension. What will happen? These guys in the middle, they have a less essentially height. All these guys around, they have a much higher. In that case, a hyperplane can separate this. So this transformation, these are very important. These are considered very interesting and important in the SVM. But again, I mean, this is some of the things that is uh, used before. I mean, uh, it, it, this uh, SPM essentially has been uh, used uh, for uh, some of, for example, uh, this, as I mentioned, so you try to find some of this, uh, somebody written some numbers, you want to say which number is that. The people at some point, they were used SVM and others do it, and it was very famous. Still, in some models, they are using it, but it's less of important nowadays given all this XG boost stuff and neural nets and that. Sometimes works for some of these that might be good. Uh, okay, so then let's talk about the clustering. So as I mentioned, clustering is one of the classical problem of the, probably the whole, I will say the all, almost all super unsupervised learning, you might be able to somehow interpret it as a cluster. Want to have a set of items, you want to put them in classes such that these items that are in the same class are somehow similar with some definition of similarity. And that's a thing that is a bit vague. So, what is the exact definition? Did you need to define some metric and just do it that? There are lots of different methods essentially to do that. Like, if you put, uh, yeah, there are several ways essentially for objective function you can think about it. But one very famous one is k means algorithm. And there are k means plus, k means plus, plus others essentially. This is a very practical algorithm. How do we do that? So you have you say you have this uh, uh, you are starting with some clustering. So you are starting with, I mean, uh, you put essentially uh, in the k means k means k center. You can select essentially these case centers at random at the beginning or some initial decisions. What will happen? Then each of these points that you have it goes to the closest center. Good. So you start with case center, say arbitrary or random. Each person goes to the closest guy. No, say these guys are going to here, these guys are going here. No. I compute a new center. What is a new center? The new center is the average of these guys. So if they are in two dimensions with average of x, y, if three dimension average of x, y, z, that will be a new center that you have. Then you will repeat. Again, each person goes to the nearest things, but with this new set of centers. Then some people may change their clusters. You will do that, and the interesting thing that this converges. 
Or this is like a heuristic, but works well, essentially. There are some papers that are several theory papers try to understand it better, but it works very well in practice. Currently, the state of the art, essentially, for clustering, regular clustering. However, there is another one. I mean, this is one thing which is very important is called hierarchical clustering. In hierarchical clustering, you try to get some kind of nested clustering. So you may think about, I mean, this is the whole point that you have it. You may want to have it a small cluster like this, the first level. Then you may want to have some clusters like this, and then you may want to have the full cluster. This is, I mean, this is called uh, uh, laminar family. What is a laminar family? A laminar family is a set of, essentially a set system. It means that a set of subsets. Such that each any two sets that you consider A and B, either A is a subset of B, or B is a subset of A, or A intersection B would be empty set. Laminar families are very good essentially for hierarchical decompositions. You create a hierarchy of this. You can also represent them by a tree uh, that we discussed. What is this tree? So for example, these two guys, this is the, like, you will put essentially node for each cluster. So here I have a cluster. So this guy is called, this one is like this, and they have one. This is the parent of this. Everyone goes to his parents, the one that belongs to that. Because of this laminar family, you can define this. This kind of hierarchical clustering are used a lot. A state of the art, this is actually, I'm happy about it. This is, the, this is called affinity clustering. Affinity clustering actually is the one that we have developed at Google. This, uh, people at Google, it is currently used in several places at Google and other places. I'm very happy there was some paper in Nature essentially that was using this affinity clustering that we developed there uh, to, uh, you said that it produced better essentially detecting autism. So that's actually, this is the state of the art. It's very simple algorithm. And you can actually read the, the implementation of that. And the, this is currently in use. This is, we check it even, uh, this also works very well with very large data. And even in medium size data, it can, or even a smaller size can beat k-means as well. So it's not only, it is more general because it gives the hierarchical clustering. K-means generally just gives you k clusters. Here gives the whole hierarchy. For and just works great essentially. And the idea also is not that hard. Essentially, if you have the points here, you have these points here. So the idea is this one, that each point select who is nearest to this. So each point is said that who is nearest to that. All of these guys, that like, there might be several people who are close to, all of this would be the first level of the class. Then each cluster says that who is the nearest cluster to this? This is the level two is created. Very simple and you can run it very efficiently and the code is there, you can just use it. Use the lot. There's some other thing like called DBS scan. These are some of these that, this use for the case that the clusters are high density areas separated by low density areas. So for example, if you consider a, like a, in the like an image, the, in the image, so the, in the clusters that you will get it in K clusters, these are more like circles in K means. Here in this DBS scan is not the case. So for example, if you have some kind of, I don't know, things uh, like it might, um, if you have some image, it might be the case that, I mean, these areas that you have it are not in the like very, nice shape. Then you might have some shape like this, essentially. Like this is the sky or something like this. For an image. This, in this case, DBS scan, for example, works much better because uh, these type of things that there are such kind of things on the top, long things, essentially, uh, K-means is not good for generating such kind of things. Anyhow, uh, 
These are some of the things that I have mentioned, the state of the art affinity clustering and k-means, but there are lots of clustering. The people are in this area are just working, I mean, persistently to design new, new clustering algorithms. As I mentioned, cl k clustering in some sense is the essence of unsupervised learning. These are different algorithms that in the scikit is there. And you just say, this is if this is the shape, all these algorithms, they are producing different things. Some of them are good, some of them are not. And I mean, you can see essentially some of these shapes essentially. You can use any of them. Yeah, and I mean, this is, I think, last but not least, also what's this kind of balance, bias variance trade off? You are, uh, I mean, I already discussed this one, this concept of underfitting and overfitting that you always try to essentially deal with it. But this is one of the most important, that you don't want to underfit because the results are not good. And at the same time, you don't want to overfit because overfit, it means that it works very well for the example that you have it, uh, but not for the, does not didn't learn the intuition to be creative for new instance. Uh, good, I think, uh, these are the things that we have. We talk about essentially some of this, uh, as I mentioned, there are neural nets, K nearest neighbor, et cetera. And these are some of the things that you can, uh, I mean, we will talk some of them maybe here about very briefly, but the other courses, the future courses, you can do that. And uh, as I mentioned, these are all of these, uh, these things. For example, if you consider uh, this random forest, this is a set of trees. Then the question is that how many trees should be generated and what is the depth of these trees? These are something called hyperparameter of this model. And you can just say to that, that I want this type of parameter to see which one pr produces the best. But again, auto uh, Amazon auto gluon, you can ask that to try all possibilities, give me which one is the best. That's the current way that the people are doing. Because by hand, yes, you may get some ideas if you have experience, you are using that, but that also is that essentially done by the machines. And of course, this uh, bias variance trade-off between overfitting and underfitting always is a problem that even with auto, uh, Amazon auto below and that you should be careful and use the model such that do regularization or others essentially to turn to over. Overfitting, I will say, is the main, more major problem because underfitting you understand, okay, this does not work even for your input data. So there is something wrong. You need to, generally, it is the case that for your input data, it should work almost 99, 95, 97, 96%, you should get the correct answer. That is the state of the art. But you should do it while you are not overfitting. That's the whole catch. Because overfitting then in the future data, it may give lots of errors. Yeah, I think I'm uh, uh, stopping here and we will continue about, uh, so we talk here about the basic stat and basic machine learning such that you can now use it for your any projects or other 